star and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good. You take care of the faith department. I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together hand in glove. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works? when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners? That faith expresses itself in works? That the works are works of faith? The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that, our, that got Abraham named <coughs> God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works? The same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works, and you get the same thing, a corpse. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Love that reading. It sounds like James R. Eugene Peterson was having a grumpy day when he translated that, or paraphrased that. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we're here because you call us. We're here because we love you. We're here because we long to know what you would have us to do with our calling and our love. So Father, be fully present during this time we share together. Speak to our hearts. Empower our lives. And as you do so, Father, either use me or speak in spite of me. But let this time bear fruit for your glory. It's in the name of your Son, it's through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to get it over with. I know that won't work. I had an engineer in the first class, the first class, first <laughs> that told me three gears won't work, Catherine, and I thought, tell me on Sunday morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> So that, but that plays into it in a little while, I hope. So just hang in. Have you heard Nike's most recent slogan? Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. I don't know about you, but I think that's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. 
The word something is so imprecise. Shouldn't we know what we believe in for sure before we risk sacrificing everything? Some of the things we choose to believe in might not be all that great at the end of the day, and then our sacrifices are worthless. Well, that's my opinion. You know, there's a uh, sermon illustration that is often used um, in connection with today's scripture from James. It's, it's about a day in the life of Charles Blondin. He was a famous French tightrope walker back in the 1800s. And on September 14, 1860, Blondin became the first person to walk across a tightrope stretched 11,000 feet, that's over a quarter of a mile, across the Niagara Falls, and what, how much? 160 feet above the falls. People from both Canada and America came from miles away to see this great feat. Can he do it? Well, he did. He walked across that rope, not once, but several times, and each time he did, he changed it up a little bit. One time he crossed on the rope in a sack, another time on stilts, another time on a bicycle, and then in the dark, and then blindfolded. One time, listen to this, I can't even cook an omelet by myself on the ground. He carried a stove out on the rope and cooked an omelet there. I know. And finally, he got a wheelbarrow, and he put in a big sack of potatoes, and he carried it across to the other side. And when he got there, he stopped, and he looked at the crowd, and he said, Do you believe I can carry a person in this wheelbarrow across that rope? And the crowd started yelling, yes, you're the greatest tightrope walker in all the world. We believe you can do it. And then he said, who wants to be first? <laughs> His question was met with deafening silence. Oftentimes, that illustration is used to condemn those who say they have faith but are unwilling to act on it. But you know what? I believe that their failure to act made perfect sense. Sure. Blondin could do what he did with the experience he had. But how would a person change up the dynamic? A person is not the same as a sack of potatoes. He's good at what he did, but is he good at everything? And was it worth the sacrifice to find out? Today's reading states that faith without works is dead. Show me what you believe by how you live. And the question for us today is what do we believe? And how do we know that what we believe is worth sacrificing everything on? Because you see, sometimes what we believe changes with the circumstances. I used to believe that if I stepped on the accelerator when the light turned green, I was going to make it safely across the crossroad. Yeah, not so much. I spent an awful lot of time watching people on the crossroads jump the light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hesitate now. I no longer believe in green lights. We must be sure that what we believe is worth the sacrifice which inevitably is required. Faith isn't intended to be blind. I don't care what fortune cookie theology says. It's not so. As Paul says in Hebrews, faith is the evidence of things unseen. The response to the glimpse of something or someone even greater than we can possibly imagine. That's the kind of faith James wrote about in his letter. 
and he used Abraham's life as an example. You may remember Abraham. God promised that old man that he would have a son born to him, not just of any woman, but of an old woman, as old almost as he was. God kept his promise. And Isaac was born to the couple when, as the scripture says, they were as good as dead. Now I find that a bit harsh. <laughs> but he made his point. Isaac was born. He was evidence of God. And life was good because Abraham was a daddy. But then as we also might remember, Isaac, when he was a young boy, his life took a turn because God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice that child of yours. What happened to Abraham's faith then? He was speechless with the father's fear. Did he believe in God enough to sacrifice everything for the one in whom he said he believed? If you go back and read that account, you will notice that Abraham only said one thing in that entire episode. When Isaac asked his daddy, where is the sheep for the sacrifice as they are making their way to the table? The only thing Abraham says is, God himself will provide. There was always a risk <coughs> that God would not provide. But he still believed and acted with a believer's courage. Because he had seen evidence of God acting all the way through his life and he wasn't going to stop now. God is a God in his, of his word. Maybe things wouldn't work out, but he had to trust God because they would in the long term. And because his faith and his works were one. Abraham's life was a blessing to the entire world through the descendants that God would give him. Because guess what? Jesus and his human genealogy is part of the family of Abraham. <coughs> Jesus, the ultimate evidence that God keeps his promises. James also mentions Rahab in his letter. He's a prostitute that lived in Jericho at the time of Joshua. She hid the Hebrews who had come as the advance team before they were going to destroy the city. And apparently, because she had seen evidence of the God of the Hebrews at work in the world around her as he had taken that ragtag army of slaves and made them into a powerful nation, she realized that their God just might act in her life as well. Her, their God might save her too. So she chose to have faith and work it out by hiding those spies and then following their instructions to hang a silver cord outside her home. It could have meant, yeah, make sure you get that one. Or it could have meant she'd be saved. And she had faith. And God blessed her beyond all knowing because she, too, is part of the human genealogy of Jesus Christ. James says that there are two kinds of faith. There's intellectual faith that passively believes that something is. And there's living faith that acts because something is. Think about Jesus his disciples. The disciples were not to continue fishing or continue collecting taxes at their table or continuing to sit under a tree and say nothing good could come out of Nazareth. They were the places that Jesus called them out of. They were the places where Jesus said, come and follow me. Don't just sit there and say, yep, there goes Jesus, the son of God and go back about your work. They were called to stand up 
and follow. Stand up and do. Stand up and be willing to sacrifice everything to leave their past life in the past and walk into the new life found only in Christ, a life that would be used to give life to others in the name of Jesus. They were to take all of their gifts, all of their graces, all of their experiences, all of their connections in their communities and roll them all together for the glory of God. They didn't just believe in their minds that Christ is God, the Savior of the world. They believed in Christ, the Lord of the world. And it changed their lives, their thinking, and their seeing of the world around them completely. Saving faith is active faith. The words we speak with our lips are lived out in our lives. Yeah, but, there's always a yeah, but. What about Paul's words, those words that every Methodist who's ever gone through confirmation class memorizes? We are saved by grace through faith, not by anything we do, so that none of us can boast that we are oh so cool, oh so holy. We are saved by faith. It's a free gift of God. And Paul speaks those words to people who do not yet know Christ. He speaks those words to those who are coming to seek out the truth that is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, this is the beginning of the journey. When you accept his forgiveness and receive him as Savior. But then Paul also says, we are saved, yet we are being saved day by day. Salvation is not a moment of profession. It is a life journey. And that's where James comes in because his letter is to those who have already accepted Christ as their Savior. And this is where the rubber meets the road. We believe he's our Savior. But is he also our Lord? Is he the boss of us? If we believe he is God, truly believe, then we're going to do what he says. And as we believe, we will live into that belief with the works of our days. And we become the evidence of Christ in the world. Christ isn't something. He's someone. He is someone that we are called to be willing to sacrifice all that we are and all that we have because we believe in him. He is very different than a pair of very expensive Nike shoes. What's the evidence that he's worth it? The tomb's empty. And he didn't have to have that stone rolled back to get out. He had to have that stone rolled back so we could see in. <coughs> That's the initial evidence. That's when he's your savior. Now, how are you going to walk into what you have seen? The more I think about these things, the more I think about our lives together in ministry at Pender, the more I am overwhelmed by the opportunity to give evidence of our faith worked out in our lives and our community. Not works that we do for their own sake, just because they're good, but works that we do to build relationship with others, to empower others, all in the name of Jesus. If the end goal of what we do is not to deepen our faith and to open up the faith of others, then it's pointless. And the Lord says, by their fruit you shall know them. Know that they belong to Christ. We are called for our work to bear fruit for his glory. And before we begin over-functioning and throw another gear, I told you I could work it in, and throw another <laughs> gear into the, into the mix, remember we are called to discernment. 
through our knowledge of scripture, through our prayers together, through our loving accountability of each other, because we can't do it all. It'll not work. But what we do, we are to do specifically and intentionally with a mind toward the proof, the evidence of Christ living in us and through us for the transformation of the world. On past Sundays, I have mentioned that you might want to think about setting up computer labs or starting resume workshops. And, and I wondered after I said it, is this a God thing or is this just a Catherine thing? But I tell you what happened. Some of the people in our congregation came up to me afterwards and said, we want to do this. And they started planning what that ministry will do. It started to strategize where we could put it and how we could share it with the community. So yeah, I think it's a God thing. We've made inroads into Greenbrier East already with the United Methodist Women Backpack Ministry, and that seed has been planted. She, they've opened the doors for all of Pender Church. I had somebody say the other day, it's time for us to go and talk with that school and see how we can support them year-round. The fruit that Christ is bearing is beginning to take root. In the past, we've offered an ESL program off campus, and I, I'm wondering what would happen if we brought that program inside our walls so that people would come and know they were welcome and know that we long to be in relationship with them and empower their success in the world. And oh yeah, why don't you come and join us for worship? What if, though, what if we started offering something called an SSL, Spanish as a second language, so that we are more empowered to speak not just the language of love, which covers all languages, but to speak it in a way that doesn't cause others to struggle. The closest equivocacy I can get of that is if you never had anything but the King James, old King James Bible, how hard is it to struggle to know God's love? It's when we hear it in a way that is familiar to us that it all opens up. What if we started that program? What if we had a prom dress boutique this spring? Prom starts with P, so I'm good. <laughs> We could offer those beautiful, never-to-be-worn-again dresses that some of us have in our closets to young girls who otherwise can't go to prom because they can't afford the dress, which will make them feel beautiful. What if we did our part to help them know how beloved and cherished they are and how beautiful they are? Come pick out a dress, girl. And go have fun. Why? Because God loves you. What if we had monthly free potlucks as church and community gathered together around table in our fellowship hall, building relationships, building trust, maybe even offering a program that would draw them in. And then we'll walk the way with them to keep them here. There are so many exciting opportunities to empower people in their day-to-day -day living and build relationships with them. There are so many opportunities to be fruitful for Christ in the world as we live out our faith through our works. All with the ultimate goal of sharing the eternal life of the good news found in Jesus. They may know about him, but do they really know him? The evidence is found in us. It's amazing what we can do. Christ is a work in us so that we can work out our faith in the world around us. And this is just the tip of the iceberg as we come and as we brainstorm together. It's amazing what God will show us. Is it risk-taking? Sure. 
Is everything going to work out just perfectly? Probably not. <clears throat> Will it be sacrificial? Absolutely. Time, talent, gifts, service. But if we believe in someone, that means being willing to sacrifice everything. We can't just say we believe. We have to work it. To God be the glory. Amen.